This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri in the United States. And with me is Dr. Stanislav Shukailov, who is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Munster. Stanislav, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Thank you for the possibility to speak to the U.S. researchers and to explain my research ideas. We're very glad to hear from you. Uh, We're going to be talking primarily about Stanislav's article in the journal Educational Studies in Mathematics, volume 89. And this was a study on the effects of prompting multiple solutions for modeling problems on students' performance. So that's going to be the article that we're focusing on. But before that, I want to get a little bit of some German insight into where your math education career began. So where did you do your graduate studies and who did you work with? I did my graduate studies at the University of Kassel in Germany, and my supervisors were Rudolf Messner and Werner Blum. Rudolf Messner is an educational scientist, and Werner Blum is a mathematics educator in Kassel. The main research Mm -hmm. questions of my dissertation was what difficulties school students have while solving modeling or real-world problems what strategies they use to overcome these difficulties, and how do the results of the study can be used for teaching mathematics. Oh, great. So you have this interest in modeling problems, and then in the study that was published in Educational Studies in Mathematics, you really focused on multiple solutions in the context of modeling problems, but you really gave a lot of attention to students being asked to give multiple solutions or a single solution path. So what was it that motivated you to really focus on multiple solutions? Um, My doctoral dissertation was written in the framework of DISM project, and we explored there the the learning environments for teaching modeling problems. And it was a cooperation project between mathematics educator, educational sites, and educational psychologists, and we have thought that it's very difficult to promote students to solve modeling problems. So uh, there were different factors that motivated me to study multiple solutions. First, solving real-world problems is important for students' current and future life, and students from all over the world have difficulties if they solve such problems. This demonstrated, Mm -hmm. for example, the PISA studies, which focus on solving real-world problems. Thus, it's important to develop and to test instructions that can improve modeling competency. Second, we don't know much about the instructional settings which can promote students' learning of the mathematics. In the case of multiple solutions, we know from the TIMS video study that lessons in high achievement countries, such as Japan, are in part different from lessons in the US and Germany. Japanese teachers demand students not simply to solve the problem, but also to find as much solutions as possible. They reward then those students who could find the most solutions. Although it was only ideal Japanese lessons that were examined in the TIMS video study, we see uh, the fundamental differences between the demand on each student to find multiple solutions in Japan and the demand to find one solution in other countries. However, we cannot derive causal links from multiple solutions to achievement based on Tim's video study. It may be other factors that explain why Japanese students are better in math than U.S. or German students. It may be because of the cultural difference or because Japanese students practice longer in solving mathematical problems or other factors may be important. Yeah. And third... Mm-hmm. Much research was done to clarify how teaching multiple solutions should be organized for improving students' achievements. In Germany, teachers often think that it's enough to pose an open-ended problem and to allow students to find multiple solutions. But multiple solutions has to be compared, contrasted, and finally linked to each other. Only in this case, you can expect positive effects of this teaching element on performance. Mm. 
When you did take on this study of the multiple solutions, who was it that you were working with? I have worked uh, together with uh, educational psychologists. Uh, she worked at DIPF, it's in Frankfurt, and uh, she is uh, Catherine Rakotzi. She helped me to use these complicated methods we have chosen there. And also my doctoral students, Andre Krug, also helped to, uh, to carry out this study. Uh, mm -hmm. For research on ethics of prompting multiple solutions, I have got a grant from German Research Foundation. It's comparable to National Science Foundation in U.S. and, sa and mm -hmm. started uh, this project four years ago. So it's uh, perhaps important to tell you about the goals of the project. Sure, um, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, the main goals were to investigate the effects of prompting students to develop multiple solutions while solving real-world problems on motivation, strategies, achievements, and also to clarify how prompting multiple solutions affect learning. The results about the effects on interest, strategies, and self-regulations were published in JME in Proceedings of PME last year and in the paper published recently in Educational Studies in Mathematics we report on the effects of prompting multiple solutions on students' performance. Mm -hmm. So um, getting into this experiment that you conducted, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about who it was that participated in the experiments, and then I'll ask you later about uh, the conditions of that experiment. The participants were German ninth graders from middle track schools, and they were about 15 years old. That was our focus because we have thought that we would like to test our learning environment in the group where you have strong mathematics students and also not so strong uh, mathematical students. Mm -hmm. Now about the conditions. Uh, we conducted a study with two experimental conditions. In one condition, students have got a modeling problem with missing information and each student was prompted to develop two solutions. The difference in solutions resulted from different assumptions that were possible while solving this kind of problems. In another experimental condition, students solved problems without missing information and were asked to find one solution only. I would like to illustrate briefly the difference between conditions using a sample problem. For example, in the problem Fire Brigade, the question was from what maximal high can the Munich Fire Brigade rescue people with a fire engine? If the engine backs up to the house, the Fire Brigade can rescue people from a greater height than if it drives forwards toward the house or parks alongside the house. Thus, students in the multiple solution condition made an assumption about the position of the engine with respect to the house and then calculate the height using Pythagorean theorem. To achieve the students find two solutions, every problem contain a formulation, find two possible solutions, write down both solution methods. So it's about a multiple solution condition. In the one solution condition, we give an information about the position of the engine in the way the engine is backed up to the tower and the ladder is completely driven out. At what height does the ladder meet the house? Write down your solution method so students have no possibility to, to choose to make assumption about uh, the position of fire engine. Mm. I'm speaking with Stanislav Shukailov from uh, the University of Munster, and we're talking about his article in Educational Studies in Mathematics. So having set up those experimental conditions now, I'm curious what you found as your main results and how those main results compare with past findings that have to do with multiple solutions. The past research about multiple solution was focused on solving problems without connection to real world and was often based on the assumption that it is important to find multiple solutions for mathematical problems. If you look in the NTCM standards, uh, you can find that it's important that students look for several solutions. However, it may be better instructional approach to solve several problems using one solution method instead of solving one problem with multiple solutions. Results from empirical studies uh, regarding to this issue 
conducted by research groups around John Starr and Bethany Rittle Johnson, both educational psychologists from the US, revealed that students shown sometimes the same and sometimes even better performance in tests if they practice one instead of two solutions methods. Multiple solutions found to be important for development of conceptual knowledge, for improvement of students' flexibility and creativity, but not obviously to better procedural knowledge. Indeed, our study showed that students who were prompted to find multiple solutions report about more interest, more self-regulation, more planning and control activities than students who developed one solution, but both groups did not differ in their performance. Mm. So I wonder now if uh, you want to tell us a little bit beneath the surface of those main findings that you have. Did you notice any other nuances or some things that came out of your data? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the goals of my research is to look beneath the surface and to try to explore why a specific teaching method works or didn't work. Thus, we hypothesized not only direct effects of treatment condition on students' outcomes, but also explored the question under what conditions prompting multiple solution may affect performance. We assumed that prompting multiple solutions increases the number of solutions developed by students in the classroom, the number of solutions has positive impact on students' perceived competency, and students' competency affects students' performance. So we assumed indirect effects of prompting multiple solutions on performance, which were mediated through number of solutions developed and students' perceived competency. This assumption was confirmed in our study and revealed classroom conditions which teachers have to be paid attention if they practice this teaching method. It's crucial to support students to develop their own solutions, and it's not enough if students only observe how other students solve their problems. Every student mm. in the classroom had work on problems and developed his own solutions before solutions are discussed in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a few of my own connections just because you're really getting me thinking about some stuff that I've thought about in the past. So one thing is uh, Staples and Kalanis have done some work about discussions. So this would be kind of when you've done some mathematical work and now you're discussing them. And they said there's a distinction between sharing discussions and collaborative discussions. Yes, of course. I think that connects to what you were just saying, where sharing discussion would be more that different students just share what they did, but they don't really engage or connect or contrast with other solutions. Yes, of course. If you, if you did not develop a solution, if you don't work on the problem, it's difficult to understand the discussion, and uh, it's no possibility to, to learn to you. All this possibility, it's not the same as if you uh, solve the, the problem. And this is crucial that teachers have to pay attention uh, that students really developed to solutions if they post such problems as a fire brigade. Hmm. The other connection that I'm making is to some work that I was involved in with uh, Beth Herbal Eisenman, Michael Steele, and Michelle Cirillo, and they've talked about teacher discourse moves to try to lead these discussions. One of the things that they've talked about is this discourse move of creating opportunities for students to engage with one another's reasoning, and a big way that you could do that would be if you have multiple solutions on the table you could use this move to try to actually get students to think about and engage with the other solution rather than just listening to it, but to actually dig into it so they have the opportunity to think about both solutions from the inside. Yes, you're absolutely right. We have a special cooperation script that we used to engage students in mathematical activities, and this uh, script we have tested in the previous study uh, in the DISM project, where we could find that it's important for students first to engage for their own with uh, a mathematical task, then to speak about a solution, their solutions, and finally they have to write and to develop their own solution. And uh, I think that a very important point 
while solving real-world problems. Because of this assumption, you can create your individual solution because every student has a possibility to make his own assumptions. And I think it's very special. You have no this possibility if you have this traditional closed and not open-ended problems. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you then what your next steps are in the research as you continue this line of inquiry. Let me begin with future research regarding to the topic multiple solution. The next mm-hmm. manus- manuscript that we are going to submit this month will analyze the power of emotions during learning as mediators of effects of prompting multiple solutions on interest and performance. Because it may be uh, this emotions is an under research domain, not only in math education, but also in education in general. And uh, in the new manuscript, we clarify the role of emotions and specifically of enjoyment and boredom as uh, achievement emotions. Further, we finished mm. a next study regarding to the multiple solution methods while solving modeling problems. In this study, students were prompted to solve a real-world problems with two different mathematical solution methods. Teachers demonstrated first the two solution methods, then students practiced both methods, discussed the connection between different solution methods, and finally every student could decide what method is the best method for him or her to use for solving this kind of real-world problems. The first results indicate the importance of flexibility and adaptivity for mathematical performance, but we didn't have the final results of this study. Great. Well, thanks so much for talking with me about that, Stanislav. And uh, I have one more question that I like to ask all my guests. And this is, if you weren't in the career of mathematics education, what would you see yourself doing instead? Um, research in Germany shown that teachers dream to be architects because architects have a lot of independence in their job, whereas architects <laughs> dream to work as a teacher because teachers are civil servants and their pay is guaranteed by German state. Thus, I I would like to underline first that I never thought to be an architect because of this independence. As a researcher and university Mm -hmm. professor, I feel myself independent and I can decide by myself what I would like to do. Moreover, my mm-hmm. career as math educator did not go straight forward from university degree through PhD degree to university professor. After doing my university degree in physics, I worked in a small publishing company and prepared books for publishing. Then I worked mm. in a larger private company as computer scientist, and finally I have my own business and sold eyeglasses along the sea promenade in Yalta on the Crimea. Oh, wow. And I'm absolutely sure that the research in math education is the best (laughs) from all jobs I have done before. (laughs) Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad you found found your way there. Thank you so much, Stanislav. This is Dr. Stanislav Shukailov from the University of Munster. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for listening to this episode of the MathEd Podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast financially, please use the PayPal donation button at mathedpodcast.com.